Yeah, my dad, boy, he was quite the man. He was, uh, he was larger than life, that guy. And he always thought big. The most incredible part is how he came to Canada, I think. Uh, he fled communist uh, Yugoslavia and he literally turned a gondola into a rowboat and uh, rowed across the uh, Adriatic there. <laughs> Imagine. So he's literally 24 hours, he said, he rowed across the sea and landed in Italy and threw him in jail. And the funniest part is how I, I heard that story. It actually wasn't from him. I, I went to Yugoslavia with him, to Montenegro. I was 19, and I'm at a bar there. And everyone, first question, because it was such a small town he's from, they say, you know, who are you from, basically? What's, what's your last name? And I said, Bullet. And he said, Bullet? He says, oh, who's there? He says, I know the story. Some guy rode across the sea here. So, I, you know, had a couple beers. I went home. I was like, Dad, this guy's talking about somebody who, he says, oh, it's me, you dodo. Yeah, that's how he talked to me. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me the story? Ah, you weren't listening, I did. And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. It was amazing, and that family took him in for some time. And uh, he came across the, got on the boat, and landed in Halifax with, uh, I think he said he had 20 bucks in his pocket, and a lot of force. Grey Lakes has such a diverse and kind of storied past that uh, really needs to be told. And so one of the big endeavors in our 30th anniversary is to get that message out, to tell the public exactly where Grey Lakes has, has come from. One thing that would surprise a lot of people about Grey Lakes is how long we've been around. When people say, you've been around for 30 years, I had no idea, I just heard about you last year. You know, the last five have been great years, but there's there was a lot of ups and downs too in there. And, Challenges with the beer, challenges with sales. This 30th anniversary is, is really special for sure. It's, it's kind of weird being, you know, I still think of myself as very young and the company being 30, it's like, I, sometimes I just can't believe how much time has passed. 2017 with the 30th anniversary, we're hoping to share that with everyone and, um, and there's going to be a lot of things coming out that uh, will surprise you. I was one of the original founders of Great Lakes Brewing Company. We used to drink a lot of beer. There was six of us and we used to drink a lot of beer, so we thought at the time that we'd just get a little microbrewery and we'd get free beer because it was so small at the time that we were building it up. We named the brewery Great Lakes Brewing Company because we originally thought that each one of the owners would have a little brewery like around the Great Lakes is how we thought about it. We had a contract brewer there helping us out and stuff, and it didn't work out. So then we hired um, a brew master, Viv Jones. He taught me how to brew. The first beers that we ever made was Unicorn Ale and Great Lakes Lager, and we started with an extract. Yeah, the original uh, location was in a small storefront uh, in a plaza on uh, Clark Boulevard in Brampton. We had a retail store there in Brampton, and it was pretty good. I mean. We only had the two products, but I mean, it was pretty good. When we opened the uh, Great Lakes Brewing Company, there was a handful of so-called craft brewings, like they were just doing a little different product, diff different than Molson's or uh, Labatt's or anything like that. So we thought we'd try in that little market. We decided on the packaging. Um, first, we talked to uh, Creamore Springs. We sat down with them, and they were in the 650 mil, I think it was glass bottle, and then Connors had the plastic bottles and uh, PET bottles seem to be the easier way to go. You could buy one skid, ten skids, whatever you wanted. My first impression of Great Lakes is that they uh, made uh, quality, more mainstream style beers. The uh, breweries initially were doing more European or uh, North American styles. Uh, Say What opened up on February 13th, 1988, a year and a day after Great Lakes opened up. It was a, a struggle to find enough craft beer to fill up eight taps. Now we have 42, and it's a struggle to find a way to get through the 200 breweries that are now open on Ontario. 
It wasn't um, accepted yet. There were little small microbreweries. That little bit of the market was really minimal. And it just, it didn't make it. It wasn't, uh, the market wasn't strong enough to change people yet. Peter Bullet, the big guy. Yeah, he was, uh, he was quite a dad. Growing up, yeah, he was a tough SOB. Imagine old school, hardcore Serbian. There was no, uh, there was no sleeping in. There was no fooling around. It was just work, work, work hard at school, and then work hard with him on the weekends and stuff. So, yeah, he was, uh, he was quite a dad. You know, it started with the stories of how he came to Canada. But he came over in 1957. Uh, he fled communist uh, Yugoslavia, and when he landed in uh, Halifax, everyone's saying, "Oh, you got to go to Winnipeg. That's where the work is. That's where the work is." And he didn't know, so they, you got a one-way train ticket, so Winnipeg he went. He started finding some odd jobs. He was painting for uh, Manitoba or uh, Hydro out there, bridges. They, you know, do things that nobody else wanted to do, like sit on a piece of wood with a rope underneath and paint the bridge, you know. Speaking Greek and Italian, he got along well there working and then uh, decided, uh, you know what, we should go to the big city, go to Toronto. I met my mom at the German Canadian Club on Sherburne. He always wanted to get into the alcohol business because uh, he wanted to buy a winery at one point and he wanted to get a distillery at another point. And the brewery came up the year before we actually bought it. Uh, so it was like 1990. We were looking to sell the brewery. Uh, it was very hard making it at the time. A real estate agent came to us who knew Peter Bullet. They were trying to sell the brewery. And so Bruce Cornish was hanging around my dad and you know trying to woo him over. And it took him about a year. And he came in and saw the plant, and the only way he would buy the brewery is if I came with the brewery. I was the one that was like basically the key person. So that's why Peter said, you have to come with me or I don't want the brewery. So we made the deal that way. You know, it was almost like, son, you want to, you want to buy a brewery? <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course, I was 21. Jeez, who would want to be involved in a brewery? At that time, you know, for every brewery that opened, two were closed. So there was there was a ton of equipment in Ontario just laying around. So we started buying a lot of stuff, <laughs> and we were in a I don't know what it was, 2,000, 2,800 square foot warehouse in Brampton, and he filled it with tanks and the mill and the mash and everything. Bought more tanks out of Connors. Connors was closing up, so we bought a whole bunch of tanks from Connors Brewing Company, and we started filling the what space we had. And it was just going crazy. And we just started making a lot of beer out of this little system and sold a lot of beer for the size of building that we were in. It was incredible how much liquid was getting pumped out. I went to high school with Peter Bullet, and I heard one summer I was looking for a job and I uh, heard through the grapevine that his father had bought a brewery. So that seemed pretty obvious to me coming out of high school that a brewery job would be pretty good. So. Next time I saw him, I said, I'm coming in and starting start and work with you. He said, well, we're not, we don't really need anybody. We don't really have any money yet. And I was like, I'll just work for beer. I, I, just, I just need beer on weekends. And he said, okay, sure, come on in and help with the bottling line, I guess then. And so I went in and it was Bruce Cornish and Peter and myself, and we ran the bottling line. I took home a 12 pack that night. I thought it was the best thing, <laughs> you know, ever. It was, it was great, so it went from there. Quickly, like we were there months, then he started looking for another building because he knew we can't stay in this little warehouse and found 30 Queen Elizabeth. We went in there and looked at it. It was a machine shop at the time. And we looked at it and it was just crazy. It was like 30,000 square feet. And so we said, okay, let's go for it. So he went and purchased the property and we bought all the different equipment from different breweries. York Brewing Company closed down. We bought the brew house out of there. Um, Connors was closing down, we went to auctions and bought the equipment out of there and we just started building it from scratch in an old machine shop. That summer coming out I was going to go to university but they offered me a full-time job getting the new brewery ready down here uh, in Etobicoke. And then uh, Mike Lackey had to like clean them all up. He was pour virus all down and clean up the tiles and scrape them all down and that's where the brew house is now. So that was my first job, taking the carpet off the floor. It took me a whole week to buff the glue off the floor and uh, so that was my first week. It was just great to put together something that you tried at the beginning and it failed 
And then you started again to put it all back together again. So with the move from uh, Brampton to Etobicoke, it was incredible. Like there was just, the equipment was three times the size. It was just, uh, and then the sales started increasing. It was just phenomenal. In the first like three years, there weren't there weren't almost any struggles. It was just it was go time. And you know I think till like '96, it was just we were making money and selling a ton of beer. And we same thing, just investing back. We had to buy our own kegs because we got into a fight with the beer store. So we invested a ton of cash into these barrels, and uh, there, there was no struggles, I think, until like 96, 97. It wasn't until 2000, the year 2000, and if you can believe it, the Grey Lakes decided, hey, we should have a brewery retail store. Uh, before that, they were just selling kegs to bars and restaurants. At the time, you know, we felt that the draft was easy. We had two brands, basically, and uh, we were just lager floggers. We were just pumping, pumping out lager and uh, and it was just that was just the business model because uh, you know dad's background he could speak Greek Serbian he had so many languages but Greek primarily because all the restaurants in the 90s were owned by the Greeks so it was easy for him to walk in speak the mother tongue tell them that he'd even say that he's Greek even though he's you know Montenegrin <laughs> but he spoke so well uh, his mother was Greek so they would just they jumped on board it was a fun place to work you know, it was uh, early brewing times in Ontario. There was Molson and Labatt, and there was just a few other little breweries. So, yeah, it was a lot of work. It was manual labor. Like, uh, back then, we just had bags of malt, which were 50 kilo bags, and we'd have to carry them through the brewery, into our mill, into pails and bags again, and then carry them up into the brew house and into the, to the mash, and we'd do that twice a day. So, and that was 40, 50, like, probably 40 bags like that. So it took us, I don't know, it took us a couple hours. And it was a lot of hard work, but I was 20 years old, so it wasn't so bad. You know, we started getting quite big and dad was getting nervous. He's like, oh, maybe we need some more help around here, like professionals, so we should get a brewmaster. And so we hired a brewmaster to sort of oversee operations. And at that time I was just doing deliveries, you know, I was the grunt. Just, Go for, go for this, do this, you know, so I did everything. Uh, at that point, it was mostly deliveries and marketing and stuff like that. And this brewmaster um, started messing things up and we had some bad beer. And then we had more bad beer. And we had to basically dump the whole brewery. It was, it was such a shame. And so, you know, we got rid of those guys. <laughs> brewmaster, schmoomaster. I started taking over the brewing operations and overseeing it and uh, then I started brewing. Those were struggling times, man. Like, we almost lost the brewery then, and that was scary. Great Lakes has always been there. They've been that, uh, that brewery that was there before everybody else and always welcoming to, uh, to the next, uh, next new brewery on, on the block. So it kind of everybody knows Great Lakes, and, and everybody thinks very good things. At Great Lakes, you know, starting in 1987 with an all-extract uh, brewery, it wasn't until the Bullet family bought it and moved it to Etobicoke that they went all grain, which, you know, better beer, fresher beer. And then the whole Bullet transformation of the brewery going from bottles only at the Brampton location to draft only at the Etobicoke location, and then literally going from an all lager brewery, production brewery, and really transforming the brewery into what we like to think of as a predominant ale production brewery now. The first real game changer for us was 2006 and it had nothing to do with beer other than the way it's taxed and because the federal government changed the tax structure for small brewers and they modeled the US. But for us it put, it put a lot of cash in our coffers that we didn't have and we struggled financially for years and years until this change came to be. And once that happened then we had some cash to buy glass and do nice stenciled bottles and have inventory, which we never had. Like we, everything was always just in time because, you know, that expression "beg, borrow, and steal" just to keep this keep this machine turning. Great 
Great Lakes is sort of a bellwether for craft brewing in Ontario. 2006, when they released Devil's Pale Ale, that was sort of the first big American-style craft beer and the first sort of canned beer that was gimmicky in the way that American craft beer is gimmicky. And it's retired now. But it seems like Great Lakes is just ahead of the curve. The OCB, they had a strategic consultant. And they said people are going to start moving away from imports and start to head craft. And we thought, well, let's try to be on top of that. So we introduced Devil's Pale Ale in 2006. And it was something that uh, the team and I were talking about for a while to sort of change this get off the lager thing and let's try an ale. And uh, said, oh, let's try to come up with something flavorful and unique. And then came up with Devils and Triple Six and all this sort of, you know, the devil made me brew it. We launched at the Toronto Festival of Beer. And it was incredible because we brought, I don't know, like 200 and some odd t-shirts. And in the past, like, no, you wouldn't be able to sell a t-shirt at a beer festival. Everyone wants it for free. And we bring these t-shirts and everyone's chomping at the bit for them. And we sold out, like, it was over 200 shirts, which basically paid for the booth and, you know, and... It was just mind-blowing. So then you're seeing all these kids running around the city with these shirts on and drinking the beer, which was, which was big and bold for the time, for sure. Gothic beer. You know, it was, uh, it was good times. I started at the brewery. We were brewing uh, Devil's Pale Ale. It was, you know, our, our up-and-coming, super cool beer, big flavor, big body, um, you know, funky branding. But we were borrowing a uh, little... I don't even think it was mobile, but it, we made it a mobile canning uh, machine from a brewery in uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake. I think we probably got about 60, maybe 60% 60 of it into cans and the rest would just be wasted on the floor. And our canning process was god-awful. There was no uh, Sessions craft canning available to come to your facility. There was some guys trying to do that and they were early days of doing it, but it was, it was bad. And we finally we bought our own machine, so that was smart. And once the cans started going out, they were just flying like we couldn't make enough. And with the launch of the seasonal programs and the business with LCBO, things started to really turn around and to have a few extra bucks now finally to be able to afford specialty raw materials and specialty packaging. It was, it was a huge change. So I've always been a part of the Bar Towel Editor's Choice Award. Uh, selection panel. In 2008, we awarded Great Lakes the best innovator. Um, and if you can believe it today, that was for orange peel, winter ale, pumpkin, and green tea. So today that wouldn't register with the craft beer drinker of uh, today's in today's market. Uh, but back then it was like, what is this brew doing? This is some venturous, bold stuff. So our, our seasonal program and, and our pilot system, it's funny how it came up to be. We used to have a brew your own place behind us and we would take base wort that we were making, say, you know, the blonde or devils, and we'd take it to the guy behind us and we'd boil it some more there and add different hops and flavors and start fooling around. And he unfortunately closed, but then we were like, well, we gotta get our own pilot system now because we don't have access, because over there it was great because he had a nice open space, you know, to brew, brew up 40, 50 liters. We found the kettle and then I just found a huge stock pot and made a mash and uh, we just started doing our own one-offs. We met a farmer, he was ex-tobacco farmer, um, because all of that crop, I guess, was going down states and Mexico. So he had this uh, infrared drying system, so we started fooling around with basically fruits and vegetables. He would dry them. And um, the orange peels, like we found a, a juice supplier, we'd buy all the orange peels, give it to the farmer. Farmer would cut them, dry them, give them back to us, and then we would put those in the beer. And actually, we went to great lengths at that time. Like we would take, like the orange peel for instance, we'd put it in an espresso coffee grinder and get like five, 10 kilos, imagine with the little, <laughs> the little grinder. And, uh, and make basically a flour powder out of these orange peels and put it in the brew. And it just made such a difference to the flavor of the beer. And it was, uh, it was lovely. So the first one that we did was winter ale. And winter ale started out to be a one-off gift that we were gonna give to our restaurant clients and put in a nice bottle. And we ended up having a party and everyone went so crazy for the beer and they wanted to buy it. So we started selling it. And then we realized that, oh my God, like people are into this. So we did another batch and we sold that again and we end up not gifting any to anybody because we, everyone was so into it that we sold it. With the pumpkin, I think it was about 
4,000 bottles, 5,000 bottles to LCBO. And we realized, obviously, like it sold out so quickly. But the seasonal program and LCBO, that was, uh, that was the start of it. And we just kept coming out with some, some fun brews. Green tea, the sweet peats. There were so many. <laughs> Miami Vice then, and we started getting more into the hop side. Eleven years ago, we uh, we went to our first craft brewers conference down in the U.S. that they hold every year. It was in San Diego that year, the first year. So to go down there, see what they were doing, go to seminars where they were talking about what they were doing, and to go to some of the breweries down there, like Stone, I remember going to, and seeing how successful they were. For sure, there was some early IPAs that I had. You know, I'd had some IPAs, but I'd never had IPAs like that. So that really was inspiring. Then you come back and just realize where you can go with this. And, and Peter was there too. We started talking about, let's get a little brewing system. One thing, you know, I think that was really smart of me, if I may say so myself, was, uh, was letting Lackey just brew on that pilot system because for a long time, that was, that's all he did. And that guy put hundreds and hundreds of beers through that system. I think a big part of it was our friendship at the beginning. He just, uh, I was allowed to do it because we were friends and he trusted me, I guess, somewhat. And then there was success with it. And, you know, he's like me, he's, he's, he's good, but it took him a long time, he's slow. <laughs> so it took him a long time to get good, but he had time to do it and I didn't mind you know, investing in him to, to do that. Oh, it was infinitely uh, beneficial. It, it's, I mean, you can read any book you want, go to school, to have that experience of literally doing hundreds of different recipes. He'd come up to me all the time with a glass of beer, and here, try this one, try this one, try this one. I'd be like, yeah, that's the one, you know, or no, no, kill that one. I, often other brewers have called that job the best brewing job in Canada, probably, and maybe they're right. I was lucky. It was a great evolution, and then using that tank 10 and getting that, that cone dimple jacketed was allowed us to do the smaller batches, and then it just kept growing and growing. For me, Great Lakes was always about Project X. Coming to the brewery, you know, every Thursday, once a month, Great Lakes would actually try different things, things that would, might never have been heard of. Many beers came out of there uh, that we all know today. Well, Project X actually, the idea behind Project X was motivated just by the beer festival, actually, the big Toronto Beer Festival. We thought, hey, it'd be pretty cool to have something one-off uh, for that beer festival, and people gobbled it up. So Project X you know, was themed as an experience like no other. Every month we'd have a little event, we'd have anywhere from 40 to 120 people show up at the brewery uh, just for a one-off. People would come often from you know pretty long distances around the city, which was great to see down in Etobicoke, you know. It gave the staff opportunity, primarily Lackey, to start playing with the pilot system and because every month now we need something fresh. The first Canuck recipe came out of that, so at the end of the day that probably would be the biggest hit. That's where we saw really hoppy beers, really kind of, wow, what is this? No other brewery in Ontario was making styles as good as Great Lakes was back then. And looking back on it now, they weren't the best beers ever, but they were adventurous, and that's what we really loved about them. And we, we got some good feedback, and you know we started selling some of the beer. It wasn't big quantities at the time, but uh, started selling some, and um, we took it to the big system, Tank 10, and, uh, and then could actually really start flowing and seeing the potential and people were getting excited about it. The Project X was definitely the gateway or the starting to the Tank 10 because Project X was primarily on the pilot system which was 80 liters and we said you know what we could do a lot more like let's uh, let's put it in Tank 10 and the reason actually there's a story behind Tank 10 because the the cone of, of the tank I had it uh, dimple jacketed so that you could cool it so that we went from 80 liters, obviously we couldn't go to the full 10,000, so we would do like 1,000 or 2,000 liters, so the cone would uh, keep the beer cold. We started with just with Tank 10. P Peter kind of said, you know, a little unofficially, like, yeah, go ahead and, and start using just that tank and you can rotate different stuff through it, so. And so it always went into Tank 10 for that reason. And then, you know, as you can almost, you know, if you had one of those cameras going with all the 
you'd see the beer level increasing as time was going on because the beers were getting much more popular and our retail stores started getting way busier and just the appetites for this, these styles were just hot. Tank 10 series is interesting to watch. Like coming up through 2010 when they had the Project X series, it, it's a series of refinements to various recipes over the course of years. It's like seven years since they started doing that. Uh, interesting to watch the IPAs develop, interesting to watch Lackey's techniques refine themselves. And over time, it's become sort of the de facto IPA experience in Ontario. You'd be really impressed. The, uh, the improvements that we've made uh, to the company itself, the people, uh, the equipment that's in there and the amount of beer that we're turning out now and you know the amount of packaged beer that we, we're selling and distributing it's I, there's a lot of things he wouldn't like <laughs> but I know overall he would be very impressed with uh, the status where we're at Crazy Canuck, you know, it was, a, it was a great evolution that we stumbled into there. Um, just being the age that I am and the Crazy Canucks, I thought that was such a, such a great name. Yeah, Canuck, uh, I guess from the start, the first name of Canuck was, uh, my parents went to the West Coast and all they brought me back was this lousy pale ale. That was the first pilot brew, uh, which was rejected quickly by everybody because of how long it was apparently. I thought it was a great name. Before my time with Great Lakes, I literally was one of the first to get that beer um, when it came out. And something about it just uh, tugged at the heartstrings and today I get it every day. And uh, I don't think in the last five years I haven't gone a day without one. But Borski and those guys, they were just wild. And we thought how fitting would that be to have a crazy Canuck beer. And it's got that sort of Canadiana. I wouldn't say maybe pioneers, but we were definitely in the you know at the forefront of the 650 mil bottle, especially the fact that we were stenciling or painting our bottles. At that time, you know, because the seasonals were all in bottles, we thought it's bottle, 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 and we just sort of kept trucking along with devils in the can. And then we said, oh, you know what? Maybe it is time to put it in a can. The LCBO wants cans, and people want to try new beers, and so. Uh, we figured, well, we should probably you know, put our crazy Canuck at the time, which was in a big bottle, into cans, and that's sort of how it all happened. So once we got rolling with that can and we started seeing how the sales were going, it, it was incredible how much it just took off. And then that sort of started saying, well, well maybe we should put some more beers in cans. It, it really started to shape Great Lakes, for sure, into the canning realm. Our 25th anniversary was, was really special. We came out with, with a lot of great beers. And I think for me it was, we started to actually get real classy on the labeling. It started making us think a little more that, hey, we could, we could do some really cool stuff. Fabian Skidmore, as some people know, was manager of the only cafe. And uh, the only cafe has been, you know, a flagship craft beer joint for quite a while. We are coming up on our 25th anniversary and uh, our um, LCBO sales guy at the time and Mike Lackey of course and a few of us, Peter, uh, and a couple other people, you know, felt like we should do something for our 25th anniversary and uh, Fabian said, well, why don't you, you know, give me a stab at it. We came up with a logo. That 25th anniversary label for sure, they, they were just so nice and classy, but it did start to get us to think, hey, we could do a lot more with these other brands and so we started thinking about changing and met up with uh, Fabian and Garnet and I don't know, then just sort of evolved into these caricatures and just fun, wacky stuff. Yeah, so the, uh, I'm sitting there uh, drawing one day and Fabian came up to me and asked me, he's like, hey, could you, could you do a drawing for me? I'm like, yeah, sure. So um, they asked me for pompous ass and I'm like, I'll have six drawings to you tomorrow. And he just did a few sketches, Garnet did a few sketches and we kind of came up with something. Everybody ended up loving it, and then they asked me to do um, work on my better wife. 
And then from there, the guys had a meeting, sat down, decided that uh, they wanted my characters for their Tank 10 series. So I started, uh, so I started working on Tank 10, and then eventually rebranded like everything. Well, the biggest challenge with working with the branding and design was to unify it and streamlining it so that it is definitely recognizable as a Great Lakes product, whether on shelves or in bars. Yeah, so coming up with a name can be, I mean, often it can, they just name themselves, like uh, we just had a beer, Alternate Facts, which was named for us. Yeah, some of them are obvious and then some are more abstract and uh, the ideas are harder. Apocalypse Later was a fun one. That was an idea I kind of thought of, uh, a, uh, a, the big scene like that with all the characters. So. Thrust and IPA was, I was doing a crossword puzzle and the answer was Thrust and I was like, ooh, that's a good beer name. I think the, the 25th anniversary beers did, did launch out some more diversity and, and it pushed the staff and the team and Lackey to, uh, to keep coming up with, with stuff that's that good. The rebranding of Canuck Pale Ale. Uh, back in the day when it was Crazy Canuck, it was in my opinion, atrocious can. Um, I'll do respect to the guys who before me. You don't realize really how bad it was till you now look back at it, but at the time it, it seemed it seemed pretty cool. Then at the rebranding, we dropped the crazy and just went with Canuck. Again, another little tweak in the recipe at that point. And I, I think it kind of got to where I liked it and maybe a lot of people did. Lumberjack actually was not my first uh, my first design for it. I had uh, John A. McDonald riding on a beaver with a hockey stick charging into war. It uh, obviously caters to um, predominant demographic that's drinking our beer. You know, certainly with the the lumberjacky look and the big beard. Now, I'm certain that people are purchasing Canuck Pale Ale just from first glance. Not certain of. Uh, what our growth is on that since the rebranding, but it's you know several hundred percent. I make the the ongoing joke. Everyone's probably heard it before. Uh, if any of us at Great Lakes went to give blood, they'd have to pull a pint of Kanaka out before they got to the blood. GLB's always had a good reputation for being a little bit experimental, and uh, but the quality's always been there. I mean it. You know, years in a row you win Brewery of the Year in Canada, obviously there's something good going on, but they didn't rest on that, they just kept innovating and making things better and uh, the quality's always been there. Favorite GLB moment for sure was the 2013 Canadian Brewery of the Year. We were out in Victoria, BC. You know, my background, I used to help run the Canadian Brewing Awards and so knew everything that kind of went into that uh, award ceremony and to come out on top um, back in 2013 that first time was just amazing. Uh, 2014 heading out to Fredericton, we won it the second year in a row, that was mind-blowing. So uh, we partied it up pretty hard that night. Winning the 2013 and 2014 Canadian Brew of the Year back-to-back -back was incredible. And for me as the owner, I think, you know, you're doing all of this stuff in the market and you're putting all these beers out, but to actually be recognized in an award, it's, it's such an honor. And I think, and I always go back to the team because everything is done so collaboratively and that was my model was to bring everybody around the table and to have input whether it's on the branding the marketing the style the flavor like everything so it, it was such a such a great honor to win that award not only for me but I think for my whole staff you know what you feel when you're showing up into a building every single day and you know you're like you take pride smells good you smell the beer you're drinking it out of the tanks that's great you've got your own feeling there's an infectious vibe at the brewery there's a lot of really relaxed happy beer drinking people you know it's great to have won those awards uh we've won a number of other awards but really you know the vibe at the brewery is really what uh, keeps things going and seems to sell the beer these days Winning the uh, the Golden Taps Award, the Ontario Brew of the Year, a lot of those ones you get voted by people. And when you get voted by people, then that really tells you something. That's a huge honor. Like, uh, that's very humbling, actually. Over the years, LCBO has been so amazing with us. 
just wanting these one-offs and these releases actually was asking us for more than we actually had. And getting listings and getting on the shelf, you know, we learned early how to do it and how to deal with, you know, I think we're pretty good at dealing with people. So it was, uh, it was easy, easy to get on the shelf and they were just so into it. And without them, obviously, I don't think we would be anywhere close to what we're doing now. And they gave us the opportunity to be on shelf and let consumers see now this new packaging. And I think they helped steer the way grocery was set up to keep, you know, 20% shelf space for craft brewers. And I went to those initial meetings with the grocery guys and they're like, oh, 20%, no, we want to, we're going to put 50%. So you could see the shift to having more craft on the shelves and wanting to help support smaller businesses is it's, it's still very alive and very fresh. I, I love the idea of having, you know, beers come in and out and we've sort of kept that model till now. So the last eight, eight, nine years, bang hit the market and bang it's gone and everyone's like, oh, where is it, where is it? So it does, it keeps the appetite rolling and people look forward to what's coming out. Great Lakes Retail Store is, it's been an amazing transformation just within the last two years. We installed an actual tasting tap room, if you will, in the retail store. Uh, it's still quite small, but we fit a lot of people in there quite comfortably and uh, we do $5 12-ounce glasses with our Buy the Glass manufacturer's license. And then we built a huge patio in the front of the brewery, which uh, come spring summer is going to be full and Food Truck Fridays will be coming back. It's just a, a neighborhood hub that people can come to, feel relaxed, and drink beer, you know, that might have been canned or kegged the exact same day that they're drinking it. Over all these years, you know, you always daydream, I've always daydreamed about a brew pub. And I thought, you know, another location where we could just keep the creativity flowing and launch right out to consumer would be incredible. And I thought, you know what, let me get the equipment and I found online that, that copper system that we now currently have. And I was like, oh yeah, that's the one. So it, it's already, it's, it's become a lot of fun and it was like, yeah, it was like a present to the brewery, if you will, or <laughs> present to myself, I don't know. <laughs> present for the guys, like everyone's excited about it. One of the, again, smartest things I've done, I think, was having the ability and having the site to buy local and to tell people that you know, I'm buying a tank and it's built on the East Mall in Etobicoke it is amazing and people can't believe it. So we've bought three tanks from them so far and we've got another four coming in. You know, they're employing, I don't know how many, 20, 30 people at that location. So for me to be able to basically invest in the community like that, that makes me really proud. Social media plays a huge part of our marketing strategy overall, our communication strategy, and we find that we can connect with people a lot faster um, in today's social media world. You know, we have 50 different beers we launch every year through the brewery retail store, and social media has played a huge part of uh, getting that message to people. We really focus on social to spread the message and then let people speak for us and get that message out to all their supporters. Collaborative brewing has always been great, uh, kind of first and foremost for um, for the camaraderie you get with other brewers. Who, um, you know, I some of my best friends now are, are brewers, uh, and it's, a lot of it's come from those collab brew days where you have a few beers and uh, come up with something, create something. People talk about the complexity of wine, and and beer kind of was always dumbed down and 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 not uh, included in that conversation, but. Uh, Beer can be just as complex and interesting as, uh, as certainly as wine, uh, maybe more so. And it, when you know what goes into making it, it's 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 probably more difficult than uh, than most people think. Collaboration is a big part of what we do. Um, we have brewers regularly into the brewery to brew on our pilot system, to share recipe creation ideas, uh, to do tap takeovers in the market with other breweries. And uh, that only leads to an all-inclusive uh, community uh, that we think consumers can see. We also um, sponsor a lot of community events and community relations around the Etobicoke, Toronto area. We throw a big charity event every year at the brewery for the Franklin Horner Community Center. 
We throw a pig roast uh, at the brewery as well in September for Toronto Beer Week. We've continued to work with Daily Bread Food Bank to do our Hops for Hunger campaign and that's been uh, very successful over the last nine years. And so giving back to the community is, is another big ethos that Grey Lakes is involved in. World domination. No, I, I don't think so. I, I do struggle with that almost daily. Like how, how big should we go? How small should we stay? Exporting out of Ontario is it's not huge on my radar. I think if we can grow this business locally and stay in Ontario, I think that would be really cool. And to just keep making more volume and more Ontarians jump on board. Because this market is it's it's huge. And I think, you know, you start shipping your beer, especially IPAs, they don't travel well. You know, we've got full control of the temperature of the beer, we've got full control of where it's sitting, how long it's sitting. Uh, the staff now, they're all, everyone's checking date codes and if something seems like didn't get rotated on a shelf, they'll, they'll take it out and put a fresh one there. And I think keeping it fresh, you know, hashtag GLB fresh, that's, uh, that's how we like to roll. And I, I think, I don't want to get too big. I think we're good size now, a little more wouldn't hurt, you know, so uh, we're limited in our building as, as we know and we've got a little bit more that we can grow in there and push the team a little harder to crank more beer out. World domination, nah, uh, I, I, like, I like where we are. I don't see us as following trends. I don't see us as uh, really being influenced by other people. We, you know, choose to do the things that we do. Sometimes, you know, 10% beer doesn't make a lot of sense, but, you know, 10%'s fun. Just watching us grow over the last five years has been um, amazing. The changes in the last five years have been uh, mind-boggling, to say the least. Smaller brewery growing very fast, but keeping a real local focus and fresh content uh, is what we're all about. First thing in the morning, doing your mash-in, the smell of you know this grain uh, cooking, really. You know, in the mash and then in the kettle, and uh, it, that always brought me back. I always wanted to be part of that, making something. We have accomplished something, finally. My mother never thought I could. I am so thankful of my relationship with Grey Lakes, and it goes back many years, and uh, every moment that I have with them is a great one. So I really thank Grey Lakes for their friendship and partnership over the years, and I look forward to many more beers together. Bruce went away for a while, but he always had that Great Lakes uh, mentality, couldn't escape it. And so he came back in 2013 and he's with us today. Part of the reasons why I came back to Great Lakes is um, I originally started it with uh, other partners and then to see it kind of not fail, but leave you and then um, have an opportunity to make it um, possibly grow again. And it's grown beyond anything I ever would have imagined. Peter's has an amazing impact on the brewery. I'm so proud of him. All the stuff that he's been through to help get to this point, like it's been incredible. It's been amazing. Amazing. Tell you when to drink it. This is a big year for GLB on our, our 30th anniversary. And I basically grew up in this beer world from such a young age, and contrary to what my wife says, I matured over the years. There's a lot of events to go to, and you try to filter so that you're not going to all these events all the time. And I think, you know, because comes a shout out, gotta definitely put one out to the wife because she puts up with a lot of crap. 
So, thanks, wife. <laughs> Let me say thank you to wife and put your hand together for the love of my life. So finally, why I'm actually standing here is for the toast. So I can't tell you honestly how humbling it is to own and to be captain of this amazing ship. But obviously a captain is nothing, absolutely nothing without his crew. And man, I think I got the best in the business. Sometimes I just can't believe how much time has passed and how much we have accomplished in this, in this time, which in relative terms is short. And I think the 30th is gonna shape us again going forward. And I think it's gonna push us harder and we're gonna do better and that's what we keep striving for. To help! <laughs> to life! <laughs> to beer! <laughs> to 30 years! <laughs> to Great Lakes Brewery! <laughs> Cheers, y'all! The Great Lakes customers, man, I wanna say thank you. Like. It's amazing that you enjoy our beer that much and you should know that we have as much passion getting it into that tin. You know, you can taste the morale. And again, my hair goes up, like it just gives me goosebumps. I get so excited. Cheers. 30 years, who would believe it? I never thought Great Lakes would hit 30 years, but Peter Bullet Jr. has done it all. I heard the summer sea murmur. Cheers to Great Lakes. Uh, congratulations on your first 30 and to 100 more. Cheers. Uh, cheers to GLB and hopefully another 30 years and a few more coffee collabs. Cheers to 30 years Great Lakes and a whole lot of years to come. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers to Great Lakes. 30 years, hopefully 30 more. Congratulations on 30 years, Great Lakes. Cheers to GLB uh, for 30 years and many more years to come. Cheers, Great Lakes, to 30 years and here's to 30 more. Cheers to Great Lakes Brewery, thank you. It's a long way from a malt extract unicorn ale to a multi-barrel conditioned Belgian style quadruple ale, whatever the hell that is. Uh, happy birthday, Great Lakes Brewing. Cheers to 30 years, Great Lakes. Cheers, always. 30 and 30 more. Great Lakes, cheers to 30 years. I don't know where I'd be without you guys. Cheers, congratulations on 30 years, Great Lakes. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers to 30 years, Great Lakes. Uh, don't know where I'd be without you. Cheers to 30 years, GLB. It's great to have been here from the beginning. Cheers to Great Lakes 30 years of making great quality beer. Cheers to 30 years. You guys friggin' rock. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers to Peter Bullitt and all the great people at Great Lakes. Hey Great Lakes, cheers for 30 years. Thanks for the beer. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers to 30 years with the great folks at Great Lakes Brewery. From Sada City to GLB, here's cheers to 30 years. Thanks guys. Cheers to Great Lakes for 30 great years. Congratulations. Here's to 30 years. Cheers to 30 years of Great Lakes. Cheers to 30 years Great Lakes, here's to 30 more. To Peter, Troy, Lackey, and to the team, uh, cheers. Cheers to 30 years, Great Lakes. And cheers to 30 years of GLB and 30 more. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers, Great Lakes, for bringing me back into the country. Cheers to 30 years, and here's to another million more. Cheers to the great beer we make here at Great Lakes Brewery, and cheers to 30 more years. Cheers to 30 years, many more to come. Cheers, Great Lakes, 30 years. Cheers for 30 years at Great Lakes, and hopefully more, many more to come. Cheers to 30 great years at Great Lakes Brewery. Cheers to another 30 years. Cheers to 30 years at Great Lakes Brewery. I look forward to many more here. Cheers to 30 years, Great Lakes Brewery. I'm glad to be part of the team. Happy 30th anniversary, Great Lakes Brewery. Cheers to 30 years and wishing you so many more together. Cheers. Hey, Great Lakes Brewery. Congratulations on 30 years of fantastic beer. Hey, congratulations, 30 years, that's amazing, cheers. Happy anniversary, Great Lakes. Cheers to 30 years of great beer. Happy anniversary to Great Lakes on their 30th. 
Let's have 30 more. Cheers. Cheers to 30 years. Here's to 30 more. Cheers to 30 years. I've never seen anyone look this good at 30. All the best to you the next 30 years. Great Lakes, cheers to 30 years. Cheers to uh, celebrating 30 years. Uh, thanks for having me. Cheers to 30 years. To all of our fans, to all of our great team, happy 30th. Cheers to 30 years. Cheers to 30 years, really happy to be part of the team. It's been a great run for you. Um, awesome to know you for this long, and here's to many more. Cheers. Happy anniversary, cheers. Just like to say thanks to everybody for a great 30 years and for supporting us, drinking our beer, and keeping me employed. Cheers. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd he go? All right, so I'll see him. <laughs>